welcome to the class okay so so far we have talked about the lambda genome the promoters and op operators uh, involved in the entire process now we will move towards the lysogeny and lytic cycle so what happens first when the virus infects the host bacteria, it incorporates its genome inside the bacterial host. Then, few things happen. What? First, transcription from PN and PR takes place. <coughs> okay? Then what should happen if this is the genome partially say and here's the in here's the c1 and here's the crow so you'll find pr here and pl here so pl will move this way pr will move this way so the first transcript we will get is the in and crow they are the first transcripts to be produced Fine. They will give proteins. Say this is the in and this is crow. Now the first, the opener is N. N is an anti terminator. What does it mean? It doesn't let the transcription terminate at their termination site. I repeat, it doesn't allow the transcription process to end. So if this is TL and this is TR1 or TR2, the transcription was supposed to end here as these are termination regions. This is T. T stands for termination. But if N binds here, this T1, this TR1 and then further here all these T sites, the transcription for the moves forward. So if such thing happens, see when there was no termination, then the RNA polymers can move this way and this way as well. Okay? So basically it allows transcription to proceed past the terminate. Then as a result, what we get? That all the genes can be transcribed here up to this Q and all. And here also this. So the system is now ready to move either way. Either this way or this way. That is towards nice gene. Now the decision is to be taken. Which way it should go? Either lysogenic or like. Now let us consider the lysogenic cycle first. Say the virus moves towards lysogenic cycle. Now as we have said earlier that the C1 is to be produced during the lysogenic cycle. But so far we have seen that no C1 is there. It is only in and cro. And if it is moving towards lysogenic cycle then cro is of no use. So it requires lysogenic protein such as C1. Now see, as N or anti terminating binds at these respective termination sites, it can produce C3 this way. The RNA pole can move the, uh, forward and can pass the TL sequence and thus it can produce C3. And in right way, it can produce C2 by passing the TR1. Okay? So C2 and C3, they can be produced in a huge amount. Okay? Now remember that C2 is the main protein here. C2 is the main transcription activator. But it is prone to protease degradation. Say the virus is going towards lysogenic setting. Then the cell must be in a very healthy state, nutrient rich state, that's it. That's why the virus has decided to move towards lysogenic cell. 
So it's pretty clear that C2 is very much prone to be degraded with the protease available inside the host cell. And that is why C3 comes as the protector. The C2, C3 complex acts together as the transcription activator, while C2 is the main one. Then what happens? What happens is that This is the C2, this is Pro, this is C1, this is N, and this is C3. Now C2, C3 complex is there. Let me denote the C2, C3 complex as this, like this. Say this is the C2, C3 complex. Then C2, C3 complex bind particularly at this PRE. binds to PRE. Not only that, it also binds to this PI as well. I always recommend you to keep the diagram you have drawn from the still photo I have given in the earlier video. So keep that with you. Okay. So if it binds at here, this PRE, then it will allow the RNA polymerase to work from here. And it will give rise to the protein called C1 or lambda repressor. Go to the table of promoters I have shown you in the earlier video, the previous video. You will find the promoter list and you will find that PRE or repressor establishment is responsible for the production of lambda repressor. Okay. Then it will start to give rise of C1, the first king. Okay? It is the first king fighting for the throne. Fine. So this C1 will slowly start to bind OA and OR. Okay? So this will bind to straight this OL and OR. Then what will happen? The RNA polymerase will not be able to bind these OL and OR anymore. That is why no transcription toward this side, no transcription toward this side, except this PI. Now remember the PI produces the integrase. Go to that table again and check that the PI, that I stands for integrase, PI produces integrase and integrase is an enzyme which helps to recombine the lambda genome into the bacterial chromosome. Clear? Therefore, the lysogeny starts to establish, starts to set up. Okay? Fine. Along with PI and P, uh, RE, it can also activate the C2-C3 complex. Uh, this one. It can also activate this PAQ region, or the PAQ promoter. What does it do? As I said earlier, that PAQ or anti-Q is an antagonist of Q MRA or the Q transcript. Q transcript is required for lytic cycle. So if the virus is planning to set up the lysogenic cycle, it must degrade all those gene products necessary for the lytic cycle. And that is why PAQ is activated with the help of C2C3 complex. And PAQ degrades the Q MRA so that no Q gene can be produced, hence no lysis, only lysogen. Now the question is, if the C1 binds to these, all these PR, uh, OR and OL and all these things, then see if OR is blocked with the C1, the PR is no more available to produce CI, uh, C1. That is if the CRO proteins bind here, at the OR, then from PRE, the RNA polymer is holds. Okay? Then no production of C uh, C um, C1, pardon? There is no C1 protein is there, lambda repressor is there, then what happens? 
then this PRM is activated. Remember PRM stands for Replacer Maintenance. Okay, this is Replacer Maintenance. Now when all these operators are blocked and the promoters are unavailable, the PRM comes into play. It does nothing. It just synthesizes the threshold amount of C1 or lambda pressure to maintain the lysogenic cycle. So that as the PRE is unavailable, uh, unavailable to produce further C1, C1 may deplete, PRM just doesn't let that happen. It balances the amount of C1 present in the cell and that is why the lysogeny is maintained. So we have seen that if the C2, C3 complex accumulates at a higher rate, it will lead to lysogeny. Whereas a higher accumulation of CRO will lead to the production of lytic cycle or the progression of lytic cycle. Now it is two stages. One is beginning and then the late stage of lytic cycle. What happens in the beginning? Crow accumulates. Okay. Now as I said in the previous video, if you remember, that it is a fight between crow and lambda repression. And if crow wins, it will lead to the lytic cycle progression. So crow simply inhibits the transcription from the operators, okay, uh, uh, from the promoters, binding to the respective operators. Now it, uh, it should also bind to OR and OL just like lambda repressor. But initially it binds at PL. Rather, I should say it binds at OL and thus block PL, but not from PR, initially, that is, that's why it is the beginning. So initially it binds to, say this is the crow, this is the crow, the crow binds to the, this is the PL and this is the PR and the OL and blocks the synthesis leftward but allows rightward this is blocked and this is allowed then what happens the c2 o p q genes are transcribed this is the purpose of allowing the rightward transcription initially so that it has the chance to transcribe the o p q all the genes necessary for lytic cycle okay fine next it points to this or as well it points here so now both the or and ol are occupied by the cro binding so cro has bound all the operators and pr and pn both are blocked from trans uh, transcription so no transcription towards rightward or leftward but OPQ they are already transcribed followed by the translation process now what happens this PR dashed is activated so that it can transcribe the structural genes that is head and tails okay so this is the function of CRO at the beginning CRO blocks the transcription from PL but allows transcription from PR so that all the lysogenic genes are inactivated such as C3, this integrase and all okay but at the same time it allows from PR so that this O, P, Q they are synthesized now remember C2 is also synthesized but what I said the C2 is the protease degradation prone so if C3 is absent C2 is of no work okay it will fail to function okay so O, P, Q, there, there, there. Now, finally, the PR is also blocked at the late stage. At the later stage, it also blocks the PR. Now, both PL and PR are unavailable. Only PR dash is activated. So from that, the structural genes will be synthesized and it will produce all the heads and tails. And finally, it will lead to the lysis or the burst of the virus cells. Okay. Now, we will learn about the game of throne between Lambda Repressor and Crow.
the throne is over and lambda repressor and crow they are fighting amongst each other to win the OR. If lambda repressor wins and bind this OR firmly, it will lead to the lysogenic cycle. Whereas if crow binds OR better, then the fate is lytic cycle. Now this is a zoomed in diagram of this region where I have shown that the operators more precisely. The operators are actually classified in these two parts, uh, these three parts rather. That's 1, 2, 3 and this 1, 2, 3, OR1, OR2, OR3 and in the opposite direction OL1, OL2, OL3. Now the lambda repressor binds the operator in this manner. It is a 236 amino acid long and a dumbbell shaped protein. So the first molecule of lambda repressor binds to this OR1 or OL1, whatever, the 1, then 2 and that's it. The 3 is in order number. So another molecule, if it binds, it will not be able to bind very firmly. Because there is no fourth operator, or the fourth, OR4, or OL4, OR there is nothing like that. So the binding is very loose. The firm binding is between OR1 and OR2. Okay, so the OL3, OR3 is basically unoccupied. That is the reason, there is a fundamental reason behind it. We will come to that later, but first we have to learn two things. That lambda repressor has an affinity towards OR at a much higher rate. That if a single lambda repressor molecule is there, it will bind the O1 first, not the O2 or O3, or O2 or O3, OR3. It will bind first the OR1, then O2, then O3. So if all the, it's, it's just, just like the window seat for uh, uh, a bus, okay? So if, if you get into a bus, you will first try to occupy the window seat, if you like so. So it's the O1 is like the window seat for lambda repressor. So it will first bind the O1, then O2, then O3. And that is why O3s uh, or O3s not occupied. Whereas the crow has the reverse affinity. That is, the crow binds first the O3, then O2, then O1. So first the O3, O3, then O2, then O1. And similarly, the OL3, OL2, OL3. But as I've said, the main uh, fundamental throne is the OR. We will consider, we will uh, concentrate on OR a bit more. Okay? So, see, when crow binds, crow is a 66 amino acid long protein. And it binds similarly. That is in dimeric form, but not uh, they are not uh, dumbbell shaped protein. They are uh, globular like structure, and they first bind the O3. So this is the O3 you can see. Then two and then one. So again three and two they comes in pair. Okay, they come in pair. So that is why Crow has occupied three and two, and then again one is unoccupied because at one it is it it does not come in pair, and that is why the Crow will not firmly bind this one. So you have seen that the affinity towards operator is a bit different and that is not by chance. There is a purpose behind this. Now look at this. The PRN region lies within the OR3. Now imagine if the lambda repressure had the affinity just as crow then it could have bind OR3 very firmly as well or it had it could bind the OR3 first then OR3 then OR1 but it is not like that because if OR3 is bound or occupied by the lambda repressor then PRM, become, uh, PRM becomes inactivated as PRM lies within the OR3 region and OR3 is already bound with the lambda repressor this PRM is no more activated so to keep this ERA activated, the lambda repressor has a very little affinity towards OR3. So when lambda repressor has bound OR1, OR2, it has reached the threshold level. That's it. Sufficient lambda repressor is there and it is binding all the OR1 and OR2 of all the lambda genome. And OR3, it is open just to keep the PRM activated so that the continuous production of lambda repressor is there. Okay? I think it is clear. If it is not, just rewind a bit and follow the lecture again. Now, OR3 is not occupied. Now look at this. Crow has a greater affinity towards OR3. Okay? Now if Crow wants to establish the lytic cycle or the virus decides to move towards lytic cycle from lysogeny, the crow is there and it will bind the OR3. Consequently, what happens? The PRM is blocked. Okay? The PRM is blocked, which leads to the decreasing production of C1. 
if PRM is blocked by Cro, then there will be no repression and maintenance. So gradually it will start to fall. The OR3, then it will bind to OR2, and again OR1 is free, unoccupied. And in this way, the Cro wins. Gradually, the binding shifts towards Cro from lambda repression. And the entire process shifts towards lytic cycle from lysogene. Again, if the situation arises that the virus wants to move towards lambda repression or the lysogene, then again, see, in case of Cro, the OR1 is unoccupied. So the first lambda repressor, which is synthesized from PRE, will bind to OR1. And then other dumbbell will bind to OR2. And that's why, and thus, it will shift the momentum towards lambda repressor binding from Cro. So if see this say so in a nutshell, we can say that consider this throne OR1, OR2, OR3. Okay, these are the three parts of a single throne. Now Cro comes, it wins OR1, OR, uh, it wins OR3, OR2. Okay, it wins OR3, OR2. Only lambda is there in OR1. So Cro wins. Crow has occupied OR3, OR2. Lambda has only OR1. So 2 among 3, 2 in 3, already occupied by Crow. So the Crow wins. And lytic cycle is there. On the other hand, if lambda repressor comes and occupies the OR1 and OR2, then Crow has only OR3. And thus, lambda repressor wins. And it establishes the lysogeny. That is why it is a game of throne between lambda and Crow. The throne is OR. And thus, the switching happens. The decision is taken accordingly. It's just like the first lambda to bind or the first crow to bind and gradually it will cooperatively progress in either side. And yes, I forgot to mention one thing. The binding is cooperative binding. Cooperative binding money? The cooperative binding means the binding at one point will induce the binding in the next. That if the lambda repressor bind at OR1 in a manner and if it binds then it will induce the binding of lambda repressor the second molecule of lambda repressor and the OR2 okay it's just like the cycle stand falling if there is a cycle stand and you have just pushed one cycle from one end all you need to generate an energy to push the first cycle the rest will do automatically okay so it's like that that is the cooperative binding so if somehow lambda wins and occupies the OR1 it will gradually bind to OR2 and OR1 and OR2 if they are occupied by the lambda that's it it's done OR3 is unoccupied in reverse if Cro is bound with the OR3 and OR2 it will lead to the lytic cycle just like that okay fine and the last but not the least if a bacterial culture is healthy then the infected lambda fudge will remain in the lysogenic form but what happens if the bacteria is suddenly exposed towards UV light or there is a sudden drop in nutrient then the virus quickly come out of the bacterial genome circularize pack themselves inside the heads and tails and all the structural proteins and they come out they just burst out what is the molecular biology behind that? that it is a red A dependent phenomenon we know that REC A is a protein involved in recombination and uh, when the system is exposed to uh, ultraviolet light or any sort of chemical mutagens and all that damage DNA, then it activate, uh, then it alters the activity of REC A protein. Okay. Now, as we know that REC A is a very important protein involved in recombination, repair, and all. So, if the activity of REC A is altered, okay. The REC A actually interacts with the lambda repressor, leading to cleavage. Okay, the lambda repressor is cleaved by this REC A. Okay, the lambda repressor is cleaved, and thus there is a sharp declination of lambda repressor protein amount, which actually helps to take over for crow and it moves towards the light itself. So this is uh, all about lambda fudge lysogeny light cycle. But surely I would recommend you to go through the textbooks now. Okay, that's it. We will see you in the next class.